Welcome to CT Small Business Toolkit, where small business innovators and influencers share the advice that will help you turn your idea into a business and your business into a success. Let's get started. Our guest this week on CT Small Business Toolkit is Jay Baer. He is the author of Hug Your Haters, How to Embrace Complaints and Keep Your Customers. He's also the president of Convince and Convert. That's an online customer service and digital marketing consultancy and media company. Jay, thanks very much for being with us. Greg, delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Everybody complains. Complain, complain, complain. Nobody ever seems to be happy, it seems like. But you're saying to embrace this for a number of reasons. First of all, you point out that customer engagement is far more critical than it ever has been in the past. And so responding to people, making them feel valued, and then actually taking the time to respond to those concerns, if they're rational and valid, uh, is only going to be good for you. So how tough of a, of a transition is this to naturally want to make peace with people rather than stiff-arming them and, and moving on to somebody else? Well, it's difficult, especially for small business, because small businesses, if somebody complains, you kind of feel like somebody's telling you that your baby is ugly, and, and that is a difficult psychological hurdle to overcome, <laughs> certainly. But but I think business has had a really easy time of it for about 500 years, because historically, all the negativity that might exist around your business, even if it's just a little, there's still some. Every business has some customers that are less than 100% satisfied. But historically, that's always played out in private, whether it's telephone, email, uh, face-to-face, letter, fax, etc. And now an increasing share of customer complaints are are playing out in public, whether it's social media, review sites like Yelp or TripAdvisor, etc., or discussion boards and forums. So a lot of the things that used to be private are now public. Uh, that makes it A, harder for business, but B, even more important to respond. Lots of friends of mine are small business owners, and they categorically and strategically and purposefully ignore customer complaints in these public channels, uh, which probably doesn't make a lot of sense because a lack of response – is interpreted as a response, a response that says, we don't care about these customers very much. Jay, you talk about two different types of haters. Uh, one is the onstage hater and one is the offstage hater. So ones who do it very publicly and, and, and ones who don't. Uh, which ones tend to give you the better feedback? Well, typically when you get somebody on the phone or via email, they are generally, not always, but generally going to give you more structured feedback because they had to actually type out an email with both hands or <laughs> wait on hold and dial the phone and kind of get their thoughts together. Now, that's not to say there aren't you know rantings and ravings on the phone or via email and that there aren't long, um, very descriptive uh, complaints or feedback uh, mechanisms online. But as a general principle, the things that we see online are, are typically more snippets, right? It's not really uh, a fully formed uh, synopsis and, and with a beginning, a middle, and end. And that's because a lot of people are literally complaining with one hand, you know, on in their smartphone while they're driving. So it's not like they're having this, you know, let me sit down and make sure that we've got the right paragraph breaks in here. So if you look at, at email complaints and say Facebook complaints and line them up side by side, you can obviously tell which one came where. <laughs> when you talk about, you call it the hatrix, who complains where and why in chapter three of your book, people who complain usually want a response, especially if it's phone or email, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But when you when you look at the, the long catalog of complaints, do people usually have a, a pretty good point uh, if business owners are honest about things or do a lot of them just come from people who want to complain? They do have a point. There is almost always a kernel of truth to every complaint. Now, I'm not saying the customer is always right because that's not true. I'm saying the customer should always be heard. Uh, and in almost every case, there is at least a kernel of truth. Um, now, there are certainly customers that, that can be vindictive or malicious or or take things out of context. But but what I hear from small business owners in particular is, well, we don't like to get involved in these online channels because customers there are just lying. Or if that's how they feel, we didn't want them as a customer anyway. And that's a very dangerous way to think about your customers and a very dangerous way to run your business. What I've discovered, Greg, in the real world, the situation is that it's not so much that the customer is lying. It's that the customer had an expectation that is way, way different than the expectation expectation they probably should have had. And so they're massively disappointed and you're like, Why? wait a second, that was never what we were intending to do. But my understanding from doing the research, and this book is full of proprietary research, is that generally speaking, the party responsible for making sure there's no miscommunication is the business, not the customer. If the customer misunderstands something, that's generally not really the fault of the customers that you didn't explain it sufficiently enough. One of my favorite pieces of advice in the book is to take 
and audit all of your customer communications. What are all the different ways that you interact with and educate and inform customers and then double that amount of communication and you're probably about right. You also talk about how to actually hug the haters. So you have a acronym here called OURS. Be human is the H. Use one channel mm-hmm. is the O. Unify your data. Resolve the issue with speed. Ours, H-O-U-R-S. Uh, one channel. Uh, I've heard uh, some business experts uh, refer to trying to stay on top of every platform is going to consume every waking hour if you try to branch into every aspect of social media as well as the more traditional methods of communication. So it's best to kind of try to funnel everything in, into one. Is, is that the point you're trying to get across there? And explain why that's such an advantage. If no, I think that's actually terrible advice. Um, I think we have to be in as many places as our customers want us to be. Um, if we are serious about customer experience and you want to be best in class at customer service, you have to answer customer questions and complaints in the venues that your customers choose, not the venues of your own convenience. And when people say they don't have the resources to do that, I say, well, that's categorically untrue. You have the resources. You just choose to not uh, deploy your resources in that way. For example, each year globally, we spend about $500 billion billion dollars a year on marketing and about nine billion dollars a year on customer service. That doesn't really make sense. And, and I say that as a marketing consultant. So if you say we 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 don't have the time or the people to be everywhere, I would say, well, why don't we spend a little bit less on marketing or a little bit less on something else and be in more places? When I talk about um, unifying the data and not switching channels, it's this. Um, and I, it's funny, I just just a second ago finished a presentation that has this exact example in it. So a lady uh, was was uh, went on Facebook and was complaining about a hospital. And she said, I've had all these trouble with the hospital and I, and I have to call and call and call. I keep having to call to complain and they keep telling me a different story and I can't get this one procedure covered by insurance. It's just like this classic tale of, of billing nightmare. So their Facebook response and credit uh, for them for responding at all, but they respond on Facebook. The first thing they say is, we're terribly sorry. Please call us at this number between nine and four. And so she instantly responds and says, did you you read what I just wrote? I've already called you like 11 times. And the first thing you tell me is to please call. That's not helping anybody. And so um, we, we have that challenge sometimes where we try to funnel all of our communication uh, through a process the business finds really convenient. In many cases, it's actually really, really frustrating for the customer. When it comes to actually winning them over, uh, how much is just making them convinced that you care about their problem and that you're committed to taking steps to resolve it, uh, go towards winning them over. You know what? (laughs) This sounds crazy, but just showing up is not half the battle. Just showing up is like 80% of the battle. We actually tested this in the research I conducted for the book and found that the overwhelming uh, share of the benefit you get from handling customer complaints in terms of customer's attitude change is in the initial response. You get a slight extra credit for actually solving the problem. So let me say this a different way. Answering and just acknowledging the problem is chicken solving the problem is gravy. It's nice to have gravy, but you have to have chicken. So you don't have to solve every problem. You just have to acknowledge every problem and you will be way, way, way better off. So if you're a business and you come to the point where you've concluded that, you know what, my customer response isn't that great. It takes me a while to get back to people. A lot of times we don't do that well in resolving or bringing them back into our store or back to our website or whatever the case might be. What are the ABCs to getting from where I am at this horrific level of customer service or even just not acceptable up to where it needs to be? The first step is really cultural, is to understand that that complaints are a gift, right? That 95%, according to to Fred Reichold and and Bain research, 95% of unhappy customers never complain in a form that you will find it. Never. They just disappear. They just don't come back, right? When you when you hear somebody say, whatever happened to Larry? He used to come in all the time. He's one of those dissatisfied customers that never raised his hand. So we have to understand philosophically that anybody who takes the time, their time, to tell us that we're less than perfect is actually doing us a favor. So that's step one. You really have to, the reason the subtitle of the book is how to embrace complaints and keep your customers, that's really what I mean. We have to say, look, a complaint is a gift and we're thankful for it. That's the first step. Uh, the second step is to listen harder, right? To, to, to make sure that we are at least monitoring uh, in more places, in more ways. 
Uh, the third piece is to is to answer quickly because speed does matter. It's not the most important thing, but it is an important thing. Uh, a fourth thing is to be empathetic, right? To understand that, look, you don't know what that person's deal is. They could be having the worst day of their life and you just got caught in the crossfire. We're, we're so quick to blame customers and to, and, to, and to take it personally. You don't really know their story. And so empathy goes a real long way. Even if it's insincere empathy, it still goes a really long way. And the last thing, and I think this is one of the most important tips in the whole book, is to follow my rule of reply only twice. And Jay's rule of reply only twice says that you never, ever, 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 ever reply to a customer more than twice in public because no good will come of it. Uh, If they complain and you answer, they complain again and you answer back. The third time they come back, you just walk away. Because today, increasingly, customer service is a spectator sport. And you've given that person two chances. But more importantly, Greg, you've shown all the people who are looking on on Facebook or Yelp or TripAdvisor or all these other places, you've shown them that you will hug your haters. You've shown them that you listen. You've shown them that you care. And at that point, you can just walk away. You don't have to wrestle every customer to the mat. And that's part of another important approach. And you mentioned several. Uh, we mentioned hours, that acronym, and, and some of the important concepts there. There's also fears, find all mentions, display empathy, answer publicly, reply only twice, switch channels. So, I mean, you, you've really covered the basics here in a very short period of time. Last question before we let you go, Jay, is that uh, a lot of folks are, are realizing now that uh, in this age of instant communication, like you said, as a spectator sport to some extent, that customer satisfaction is is such a much bigger priority than it ever was in previous generations. So everyone's trying to compete on that playing field Mm -hmm. at a much higher level. So once you've gone from mediocre or bad to actually responding in a way that, that impresses people, how do you actually outshine the competition that is on that exact same strategy course? The good news is is that most of your competitors are bad at it. Um, Even if they think they're good at it, they're not. So that that's helpful. Uh, the the fact that most people are using a 1995 playbook to solve 2016 customer service challenges is actually good news for business people because um, even if even if their competition wants to do it well, they typically aren't actually doing it well. So the key to to sort of be to to, to get known for it, right? To to make it a circumstance where customer service is the new marketing is, is you have to do something, one particular dimension of it, so well that it forces your customers to talk about it. It's what we call a talk trigger. So maybe you're so fast they can't believe how fast you got back to them or they can't believe that you'll answer them everywhere or they can't believe uh, as is the case with a, a lady named Debbie Goldberg who I interviewed for the book who when somebody complains about her pizza restaurant she says we're terribly sorry uh, that we disappointed you may we send you a gift card so that you'll give us another chance and if somebody leaves a positive review she says hey thanks I'm really delighted that you liked it here's a gift card could you bring somebody with you next time who's never been to our location Right. It's mm-hmm. things like that. You have to audit kind of your own process and say, what can we do? What's the one thing that we can do that customers would not believe? And when you when you hit on that, it forces them to to engage in word of mouth and that builds your business. We have just scratched the surface. As Jay said at the beginning, there's a ton of data in here. There's a ton of anecdotes in here. And it really is uh, extremely helpful. It's easy to read. And uh, I, I think anyone who wants to really make peace with disgruntled customers and just understand customer response in general is going to get a lot out of this book. It's Hug Your Haters, How to Embrace Complaints and Keep Your Customers. Jay, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, Greg, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Jay Barris, the author. Again, the book. Hug your haters. I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for CT Small Business Toolkit. Thanks for joining us on CT Small Business Toolkit. Be sure to visit our website, ct.walterskluwer.com, and follow at CT Corporation on Twitter. We'll see you next time on CT Small Business Toolkit.